Welcome to all of our Price family members and our scholars. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Dr. Helen Griffith, Executive Director of the Price School UC San Diego, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this Price Vaccine Mandate Town Hall. Thank you again for coming. We're happy to have you with us today because we're going to talk about important aspects and details related to the University of California from the Office of the President, the vaccine mandate, and how it impacts price in our campus here at UC San Diego. Tonight, please feel free to use the Q&A window to submit your questions for our panelists throughout the presentations this evening. The Q&A portion is located at the bottom of your screen. Also, please be sure to submit and write your full name and your scholar's name and grade into the Q&A window. We wanna track your attendance tonight so that we may give you your full participation hours for, for coming. If both parents are present and you're using one device, please write both names so both of you can get credit for participating. I'd like to just say that due to our time limitation tonight, we might not be able to get to all of your questions, but we will log all questions and we will create an answer sheet for you in a Q&A FAQ on our PROICE website and the San Diego Return to Learn website. Tonight, we have closed captioning available in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. For English captions, click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. For Spanish and Vietnamese captions, click on the links in the chat. Spanish audio will also be available by clicking on the world icon button at the bottom of your screen and select Spanish. Now, I would like to introduce you to our first presenter, Dr. Chip Schooley, who is professor of medicine at UC San Diego to talk about the Delta variant and vaccine safety. We're also very proud to let you know that he is our Price physician of record. We couldn't have a more impactful speaker on tonight. Go ahead, take it away, Dr. Chip Schooley. Thanks very much, Dr. Griffith. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you tonight, uh, all of you proud parents of, uh, of uh, children going to a wonderful school. Uh, I'm just going to start tonight with a few framing comments about what we're dealing with uh, and a few comments about where the vaccines are. And I hope we'll have some time for a lot of uh, interactions among us. As all of you have been watching, we've been seeing a resurgence of virus in the United States that started uh, just about the beginning of July uh, that has been uh, most uh, pronounced in parts of the United States where the fewest people have been vaccinated, the Southeastern United States. In those parts of the US, uh, cases are as high as they were at the peak of the, of the outbreak. California hasn't quite gotten, uh, is not there yet because we've been quite fortunate with the vaccination rate. But let me spend some time talking about where things are in San Diego itself. Next slide. San Diego's uh, epidemiology is very much like what we saw in the uh, country. We've had three peaks the biggest one over the course of uh, December, January. And then what you can see is that over the course of the last uh, six weeks, a gradual increase uh, in uh, San Diego that uh, followed next, the appearance of the Delta variant, uh, a new variant of the virus that is more infectious and better able to spread that, uh, than um, the variants we've been dealing with in the past that happened to arrive just about a month before we opened the doors to uh, wandering around without masks uh, indoors and, and gave the Delta variant a chance to reverse the progress we've made in late spring uh, with, uh, with the vaccination um, increase that uh, occurred at that time. Next slide. Now, what we're seeing in San Diego now uh, is that the, um, if you look at the top part of this graph, uh, the largest number of cases are occurring in uh, people between 20 and 40. In other words, uh, people in, of um, the age of having children in elementary school uh, and who are quite busy working and interacting with each other. Uh, if you look down at the bottom slide, uh, these folks are much less likely to get into trouble than people who are over 60 in the blue line on top, because we're still seeing people who are getting sick being the ones who had the greatest risk factors for that in the past. And that's mainly people who are ill, who have underlying organ disease uh, and who um, uh, otherwise uh, would have gotten much, much uh, sicker in the pre-vaccine days. Next slide. Among children, 
uh, we're in particular seeing cases rise in children between six and 11 years of age. And that is children who aren't quite old enough to be vaccinated yet. Uh, as you know, uh, vaccines uh, are available uh, for children age 12 and above. Uh, and we're seeing that impact on the amount of, of COVID in that age group. But the age, people who are in, uh, the children who are in elementary school are still having uh, large numbers of cases um, over the course of the last six weeks in San Diego. Next slide. Now, what about the Delta variant? Viruses change over time and they get better at doing what they like to do, which is to infect people or animals or whatever their natural host is. The Delta variant is no, is no exception. It grows more rapidly than the strains of the virus we were seeing in the last winter and last summer. It gets to higher levels uh, in our lungs and noses very quickly, and that makes it able to spread from person to person much more efficiently. And because it grows more rapidly, it can cause more serious disease than we were seeing before Delta came along. Next slide. To put this into perspective, uh, if you look on the uh, bottom of this slide, starting on the left side and going to the right, the farther to the right a virus is, the more likely it is, the more easily it is to be transmitted. And you can see that measles is the most transmittable viral disease we have. Uh, those of you who remember the pre-measles vaccine days will remember that if you walked into a classroom uh, um, with, and you had a child with measles in that classroom and you hadn't had it, you were very likely to get it because it would spread throughout the classroom uh, within the course of a single period of, of uh, class. On the other hand, way over on the right, you can see flu is much less efficient, on the left, I'm sorry, seasonal flu is much less efficient at being able to get spread from person to person. The SARS strains that we were dealing with until the Delta strain came along were much more like flu. But with the emergence of the Delta strain in the big blue box, you can see that what we're dealing with now is a virus that's much more like chickenpox. And chickenpox is a very highly contagious childhood illness. So it's taking advantage of things that in the past, um, the older strains of SARS couldn't uh, take advantage of to move around and is uh, leading to a rapid increase of cases uh, in our community. Next slide. So to get to the vaccinations, why should this be a priority for us? The most important thing of, that vaccines do for us is they keep us from getting sick. And as I'll show you, uh, the vaccines that we have for this virus are very good at that. Viruses also uh, decrease the number of people who get infected, and they can decrease the amount of virus that a given person has if they do get infected. And these viruses, these vaccines do that, although not quite as well as they are, uh, uh, as they do at keeping us from getting sick. Next slide. To illustrate that, this is what is going on in San Diego County. These are data from the San Diego County Health Department. If you look at that blue dotted line, you can see starting about the 1st of July, there was an increase in the number of cases in San Diego County. The dashed green line below that shows you a, um, that among the people in San Diego County who were vaccinated, the rise was much less pronounced. And in the orange line, you can see that people who were not vaccinated were much, much more likely to become infected. In fact, nine times more likely to become infected than those who were not uh, than who were vaccinated. So being vaccinated uh, made you nine times less likely to get infected in this recent surge than if you were unvaccinated. Next slide. More importantly, uh, in terms of getting sick, you can see that again, using the same format, more people getting sick and getting hospitalized in San Diego County and the dotted blue line, but you can barely see that, uh, that dashed green line budge uh, and you can see again, a big increase in the number of unvaccinated people in orange uh, rising uh, as people, as the uh, Delta variant moved in. So the hospital surge we're seeing, the people in the hospital are the people on that orange line who've not been vaccinated. You have 30 times greater a chance of being in the hospital with this virus if you get infected and are not vaccinated than if you're vaccinated. Next slide. Now, what about the vaccines? Uh, there are several vaccines available. The ones in red are the ones that we can get in the United States today. Functionally speaking, the ones that are being used primarily are the uh, first two there, the messenger RNA vaccines made by Pfizer and by Moderna. Next slide. 
The Pfizer vaccine, in fact, was granted full approval by the FDA on Monday, uh, which puts it on par with all the other vaccines we use, the influenza vaccine, chickenpox vaccine, measles vaccines, all the uh, vaccines that we use for childhood and adult diseases. Uh, it's a uh, very safe vaccine we'll discuss in just a minute. But first, let me tell you how it works. Next slide. Uh, this is a cartoon of uh, a, uh, how our cells in our body make the proteins that make us up. That hamburger looking structure is a protein machine called a ribosome. And the ribosome knows what proteins to make by reading a code called messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is read from the, our genetic code in our nucleus of the cells, the DNA. It comes out to the, uh, to the uh, ribosomes in the cell. The ribosomes read that and say, okay, this messenger RNA is telling me to make a protein that makes your hair black or that makes your eyes green or that uh, makes this cell a fingernail. What we do with these uh, messenger RNA vaccines is make a messenger RNA that says, make a small piece of the virus, not the whole virus, but just the outside of the virus, the so-called spike protein, uh, so that the immune system of that person can see what it looks like. So the ribosome does what it's told. Uh, it just reads the code and makes the spike protein. Uh, the RNA that uh, is injected with the vaccine is degraded in about 12 hours, like all messenger RNAs are, uh, and is recycled to tell the cell to do something else uh, in terms of proteins. And the viral spike protein sticks around for about 36 to 48 hours. During that time, your immune system looks at it, sees what it looks like, and gets ready for it to appear again in case you get exposed to the virus so that you can keep the virus from being able to grow as effectively. Now, how are these vaccines tolerated? Next slide. Uh, this is a slide that might be difficult to see, but if you just look at the left panel, those higher bars um, are the fraction of people who have a sore arm after they get a, a, a vaccination. This is very much like almost any other vaccination. You get a flu shot, your arm is sore for a day or so. In the right panels, you can see that a smaller fraction of people will have um, flu-like symptoms, just feel tired, may have low-grade fevers that last a day or so. These two go away. So this vaccine is very much like most others uh, that you get uh, for childhood and adult diseases. Sore arm, a little bit of uh, tiredness uh, and fever for the next day or so. Uh, next slide. The, 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 the uh, side effect that has been talked about most uh, with these messenger RNA vaccines is myocarditis. Uh, it sounds like a complicated word, but it's not. Myocardium is the heart muscle. Itis is just a medical term for inflammation. And so what we think happens with the, uh, these very rare cases, it turns out to be about three people and 100,000 people who get vaccinated have this uh, condition uh, that lasts for several days. It's just an inflammation of the heart that goes away after the, um, the uh, viral protein is digested. Uh, and people uh, in the meantime, make an immune response to the, uh, to the virus so that if they see the real virus, uh, they won't get sick. If you're not vaccinated and get COVID, your likelihood of having uh, this complication is many times greater. So although there is a small risk of myocarditis with the vaccine, there's a much larger risk if you don't get vaccinated and actually get infected. Uh, and then final slide, just getting back to where we were, uh, why are we recommending vaccinations? We want to keep people from getting sick. We want to reduce the number of people uh, in the community who are getting sick so we can keep the schools open, keep us all working, and get us back to doing what we would like to do. Now, let me turn this back over to Dr. Griffith. Thank you, Dr. Schooley. That was very informative, and we're so glad you're here tonight to share that information. Um, next, we'll hear from Dr. Cynthia Jamfi bannerman She's the chair of the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. She'll be talking tonight about the vaccine and pregnancy. And yes, pregnancy for our parents. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Griffith. Um, I appreciate the invitation to speak. Um, as she mentioned, I'm the chair of OBGYN and Reproductive Sciences here at UCSD. Um, and it's really important to get the message out about um, the risks with pregnancy. 
Um, so this first slide just shows that if you're a pregnant woman and you get COVID and a COVID infection, you have worse outcomes than if you're a woman who's not pregnant. So you're more likely to be admitted to the ICU. You're more likely to need a breathing machine or ventilation. You're more likely to need ECMO and you're more likely to die. Um, and this is why the CDC has uh, designated pregnancy as a high risk condition. And the reason that this is so important is that only about one in four pregnant women are vaccinated. So that's only about 23% looking at the latest CDC numbers. And so we're really trying to get the message out about the safety of the vaccine in pregnancy and for people who are considering pregnancy and for people who are breastfeeding. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna quickly review the way these vaccines work using the lens of pregnancy. Um, Dr. Schooley gave a really nice uh, overview of this, but let's look at what it means for a pregnant person. Um, so the vaccine carries genetic information to make the spike uh, protein, which is are the beautiful kind of red spikes you see on this terrible virus. Um, and it recognizes that, but not the actual virus. And so your immune system then says that it's seen this. The vaccine itself, the mRNA that it comes in, disappears from your body within a couple of days. It doesn't enter the nucleus or any part of your cell, um, and it acts locally. We also know it doesn't cross the placenta in any way. Some of you might remember that when you're pregnant, you don't receive certain vaccines. This particular vaccine is not a live vaccine, um, and so it is okay as safe to give in pregnancy. It doesn't enter the nucleus of the cell, and it doesn't change your DNA in any way or any genetic material for you or your developing baby. Next slide, please. There's also a lot of data to show that it's safe in pregnancy. Uh, as you know, pregnancy is nine months, and so we had to wait a little while to get some of this data. Um, but the CDC has a reporting system where pregnant women were able to enter their information. And uh, a few months ago, they released some of the data from the first two and a half months or so of vaccination. There are about 36,000 women who were pregnant, and about 4,000 of them entered their information into vSafe, and then 827 of them completed a pregnancy, and this first paper was looking at their outcomes. Um, importantly, the goal was to look at um, miscarriage, stillbirth, or adverse pregnancy outcomes among vaccinated women, and then compare that to historic uh, numbers with pregnant women before the pandemic. And there was really no difference. So there were no difference in rates uh, of miscarriage or stillbirth or any bad outcomes. Uh, including preterm delivery. And so the, this was uh, early data to suggest that it was very safe in pregnancy. Next slide, please. But then a few weeks ago, the CDC released even more data showing the safety of this vaccine. Um, they looked at nearly 2,500 pregnant women um, who had received the vaccine and followed their outcomes either right before they were pregnant, so preconceptionally, or in the first a uh, couple months of the pregnancy, so before 20 weeks. And they found, again, no difference in miscarriage rates uh, compared to the background um, and no increase in birth defects. Uh, and so this data, I think, is what allowed um, the CDC to really recommend vaccination in pregnancy. Next slide, please. Um, so what about if you're considering pregnancy? So there's been a lot of misinformation and false information on the internet about how the vaccine affects fertility. We have very good data to show that it does not affect, for, uh, affect fertility in any way. The study on the top right uh, looks at women who were in an IVF clinic, uh, a very busy IVF clinic, and they divided those women into women who had been vaccinated uh, and, and women who had not been vaccinated. And they looked at the success of the IVF in those groups, and it was similar in both groups. And there's more data to show the safety of it in pregnancy for people who are considering pregnancy. Uh, it didn't change your fertility. The bottom uh, left shows um, another study in males where they had 70 healthy males who uh, had their semen analyses done to look at the sperm, um, realized that, you know, looked at them, noticed it was normal, then they got vaccinated, and then they waited 70 days, and then they repeated the semen analyses, and there was no effect on the quality uh, or quantity of the sperm. Uh, and after this, several other studies show the safety for folks considering um, pregnancy, and it didn't change uh, fertility in any way. Next slide, please. So putting all of this together, let's see if I, I can't see the next slide. There we go. So putting all of this together, um, the recommendations changed um, in July and then it also uh, this past month or this current month um, from the organizations that make recommendations in pregnancy. So the American College of OBGYN, 
the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, um, ASRM, and then CDC. All groups recommended vaccination in pregnancy, whereas previously they had said that it should be offered to pregnant women, but not necessarily recommended. So it became a much stronger recommendation. The Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine said vaccination is the best method to reduce maternal and fetal complications from COVID. ASRM said it's the best way to reduce maternal and fetal complications during pregnancy. And the CDC said if you're pregnant, breastfeeding, or even considering pregnancy, you should absolutely get vaccinated. And because, like I started with, only one in four or 23% of pregnant women are vaccinated, we are seeing a lot of complications in the hospitals around the country. And as obstetricians, we are asking you um, to really consider vaccination during pregnancy. That was my last slide. And thank you very much, Dr. Griffin. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jampi. Excellent information from both you and Dr. Schooley. And now we will hear about our safety guidelines and the vaccine mandate from Dr. Angela Scotia, Interim Executive Director of Student Health and Wellbeing. She's also the chair of the Vaccine Mandate Working Group. Thank you for coming tonight, Dr. Scotia. Well, thank you and good evening, everyone. So let's start with our concept for keeping the campus community safe. We liken it to a Swiss cheese model. And if you think of Swiss cheese, there are holes here and there if you put a lot of layers together, you can really block the transmission or block things getting through a solid block of Swiss cheese. We have three core areas, viral detection, intervention, and risk mitigation. Reducing risk, clearly the greatest way to reduce risk is to get vaccinated. Um, you just heard it from Dr. Schooley, Dr. Jamfi Vanderman, this is critical to reducing your risk of complication and the spread of this virus. So getting vaccinated is the core first step. Then we have a variety of interventions, wearing face coverings, getting the notify, Cal notify on your phone so you can be notified if you're exposed, isolating individuals who have a positive test, quarantining individuals who may not be vaccinated and are at risk after an exposure, as well as regular testing uh, for COVID-19 and screening for symptoms. All of these layers together create a solid block, which really protects the individual to a large degree. Next slide. For this reason, we can recommend daily symptom screening. If you have symptoms, stay at home, call the attendance line at school, explain your situation, get a COVID test, make sure you're okay, and then return if your symptoms have improved. So daily checking on symptoms of COVID-19 is a great way to reduce the chance that you would inadvertently come to school or expose other people to an infection. So that will stay in place. Next slide. And then we have our vaccine mandate. So the University of California Office of the President has recommended for all of the campuses in our system, including Price, where you're part of our campus community, that you follow a vaccine mandate. It has two basic elements. You're either fully vaccinated or you have an approved exception or deferral. So what does it mean to be fully vaccinated? That means you've completed your vaccination series. If you're getting the messenger RNAs, such as Pfizer or Moderna, it's two doses, then another two weeks. At that point, you're fully vaccinated. The Johnson & Johnson is a single dose, but again, you wait two weeks after that dose, and then you've achieved full vaccination status. So if you're fully vaccinated, you're in compliance with the mandate. The alternative is there are a series of potential exceptions or deferrals, which you may qualify for, but you need to put a request for that exception or deferral in no later than September the 6th to be compliant. We actually do it by the 2nd so we can have it recorded because the mandate goes into effect on September the 6th. So we know we have a, a holiday weekend coming in there. So please get everything in paperwork. If you're applying for an exception or you've been vaccinated, share your vaccine information by September the 2nd. What are the categories for exception or exemption? They are medical exemptions, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Disability, either of those can be temporary or permanent, a religious exception, or a deferral for pregnancy. But as you just heard, when the mandate was conceived of a few months ago, the evidence wasn't as quite as strong as it is now. Um, and you heard some very clear evidence that there is a serious, significant benefit to vaccination for pregnant women and no reason to defer this. But if you feel you should, 
there you are allowed under the mandate to have a deferral. Now we hope most of our students aren't planning pregnancies. We want them to complete their high school and their education before their pregnancies. But if you were to need that, that is a possibility there. Please bring your vaccine information form to the PROIS front office so that we record that you have been vaccinated. They also have exception and deferral forms. Now, medical exemptions can be temporary. One of the examples may be, I just had COVID-19. I Unfortunately, the student acquired the infection. We don't recommend you immediately vaccinate, but you can delay vaccination under the mandate up to 90 days. You don't have to wait that long, but we want you feeling a little bit better. So you'll get a temporary exemption if you've recently had a COVID-19 diagnosis or you have an antibody test which reflects a prior infection. There are also a small number of individuals that the CDC there have approved medical, there are medical contraindications to vaccination. This is very few, um, but there are some individuals who have had serious complications from another type of vaccine and we would not recommend vaccination. There are rarely some disability situations similarly. So though in those two situations, you'll need a medical provider, someone who's cared for the student to provide an exemption form and fill that out. Religious exceptions are also granted for those with firmly held beliefs against vaccination, although most recognized religions support vaccination. Next step, next slide. So yeah, just to remind folks, if you're applying for medical or disability, you will need a healthcare provider to certify the appropriateness of the vaccine. And these could be temporary or they may be permanent exemptions. Next slide. Individuals who are not vaccinated need to agree to follow the non-pharmaceutical interventions. These are efforts that each campus defines to minimize the risk of a transmission of the virus, either acquiring it or spreading it to others. These can include masking as well as periodic testing for COVID-19, even when you don't have symptoms. It is required of everyone who has an exception or a deferral. We also have many of these measures for the vaccinated community as well. So masking is something we do regardless of whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. The testing models though may vary for vaccinated individuals versus unvaccinated individuals. Next slide. We always want people to test if they have symptoms. Now we're working to develop on-site testing for the price community. We're starting this now in the, over the next week in small groups to get a nice efficient way so students can be tested on campus. We hope with time that we'll be able to teach our students to self-test. We've been using this for our college students and our graduate students. It's been working wonderfully. We also know other campuses in the San Diego have been able to deploy this with younger individuals and self-testing is super easy. So our goal is basically to then create the situation where students can have easy access to testing. We can do this surveillance testing for our students. Um, next slide. Okay, the last thing I wanna remind you is you can um, acquire on your phone the Cal COVID Notify app. This uses Bluetooth technology to actually show when a positive case, they can using uh, the technology behind the scenes identify individuals that that phone of the positive person has been near the phone of another individual for a period of time and proximity, closeness. So time and closeness that suggest they may have been exposed to the virus. And if you get this notice, then we want you to be careful of symptoms and get additional COVID testing. You also may be contacted by a public health person when there is a known definite exposure separate from this technology approach. Next slide. I think we'll be transitioning in a second and I'll be able to help you with questions in a few minutes. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Sosha. Very good information again. Next, we have another uh, expert in the field here to share with us tonight. We'll be hearing from Dr. Natasha Martin. She's the Associate Professor in Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health on Wastewater Testing. Thank you, Dr. Natasha Martin, for coming tonight. Thank you, Dr. Griffith. Good evening, everybody. So I'm here to talk about another layer of our Swiss cheese model that we've been implementing on campus, and that is the wastewater monitoring program. Um, 
the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can be detected in stool. And so what we've been doing is we have, we have placed these robots, these wastewater samplers in, um, in the sewer across campus, and we collect the wastewater every day and we test it for the virus. And where, we, where that is positive, we can then alert residents who are living or working in those buildings um, that they should get tested um, to make sure that they are not infected. So currently we have a very um, aggressive program. We have 126 samplers, which collects wastewater from over 340 buildings on campus, both residential and non-residential. And those samples are collected daily and they're transported to the lab and they're tested for the virus using PCR um, tests. And we are in the process right now of sample of um, installing an additional four samplers at the Preuss building this week, um, which will add another layer of information and monitoring in terms of um, viral activity on the campus. Next slide, please. And so we've learned a lot from this uh, wastewater monitoring effort. The main thing that we've learned is that wastewater monitoring is incredibly sensitive at detecting infections. Um, across the year that we've been doing this, between 74 and 80% of all infections that we detected in the residences on our campus were associated with a positive wastewater signal. So it means that the wastewater um, is highly sensitive at, at, at picking up a signal of even one asymptomatic infection among several hundred students living or working um, in a building. So, this year, we will be working with the Price leadership to issue wastewater alerts if we see um, concerning wastewater signals. And what we've learned through our efforts on campus is that uh, wastewater notifications do increase the likelihood of testing. They double testing among our residential students. So we're able to see signals in the wastewater and then get people tested afterwards. And we have been able to detect through our wastewater monitoring program um, asymptomatic individuals who are infected and then sub could subsequently then isolate those individuals and prevent those infections from spreading on campus. So wastewater monitoring is an, is an important component of our monitoring response and we look forward to working with the Price leadership this year on that program. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Griffith. Dr. Martin, thank you so much. What an exciting time to be at UC San Diego on the campus with all of these revolutionary implementations to help us stop the spread of COVID on our campus and hopefully in our community. This is an opportunity now, and as our panelists are um, coming off of their, coming onto video, we invite you to turn on your cameras because we're now going to go into our Q&A portion of this program. Um, during the registration, attendees have the opportunity to submit questions for the panelists to answer tonight. We've selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today. But if you have a question now, please put it in the Q&A window to submit it for additional questions during this session. And our panelists will do their best to try to provide answers for us tonight. But due to time limitations, obviously, we may not be able to get to all of your questions. However, we'll do our best to post answers in the FAQ at returntolearn.ucsd.edu. I'm going to begin with our first question, and it's for you, Dr. Schooley. When do you expect that booster shots will be needed and available? And also, will they be mandated? We're expecting booster shots to be needed uh, for this uh, virus like we do for most others. Um, coronaviruses um, are uh, among the viruses that our immune system likes to forget the fastest. And we've seen for many years, other coronaviruses that don't cause severe disease circulating in the human population Every two or three years, they come and uh, we get colds and flu-like symptoms and they go away. They boost the immunity of everybody in the community and they disappear for a few years and come back again when the immunity is declined. And this coronavirus is just like all of those. Uh, after infection or after vaccination, your immune system starts looking at other things and focusing on them and the immune uh, titers decline. Uh, what we've learned at UC San Diego Health is after about six months, uh, the level of immunity declines. We begin to see more people having what we've been calling, for lack of a better term, breakthrough infections. And what these are, are people who have previously been vaccinated. They have some immunity, not enough to prevent them from getting infected, but enough to prevent them from getting seriously ill. They generally have kind of sniffles and feel like they've got a cold. Uh, and with the exception of people who have underlying uh, immune system problems like 
transplant patients and people with cancer, these people recover and do well. Uh, we've been seeing this in the health system and uh, we think it's important to stop this for two reasons. One is we don't want people to be ill. And secondly, we, want, we really need to have our uh, people be able to stay at work because we have a lot of sick patients to take care of and it's been a challenge keeping things fully staffed to be able to take care of people with cancer and other diseases. It's really disruptive to have people out. And the same thing will be true in our student population uh, as they get six or eight months out, they were vaccinated later, but as they get uh, out, they're gonna be missing class and so forth and so on. So we'll have to watch the, um, the, uh, reinfection, the uh, reinfection rate and give booster shots with this virus, just like with others. Uh, right now we're focusing on getting everybody vaccinated once uh, and offering booster shots to people who get to be six or eight months out. Uh, this will be discussed formally at the CDC in Atlanta on Tuesday and more concrete recommendations will be coming from there. Thank you, Dr. Scully. We appreciate that answer. And the next question is for you, so get ready again. Of the people testing positive for COVID right now, what percentage of them are vaccinated versus unvaccinated? It depends on where you are uh, in the in San Diego, um, because most people have been vaccinated. Um, you know, our our campus, for example, ninety or our, our hospital, ninety percent of the people in our hospital have been vaccinated. So we have about an equal number of people who have been vaccinated and not vaccinated who are becoming infected. But that means because nine times as many people are unvaccinated, if you're not vac. Uh, nine times as many people are vaccinated as unvaccinated, the chance of any vaccinated person getting infected is nine times lower than if they're unvaccinated. So we have many fewer people. Um, there's mo much lower risk of getting infected if you're vaccinated, but because we have so many more vaccinated people, we're having about as many of them getting infected, but mildly ill compared to those who are not vaccinated and are getting more severely ill for a longer period of time. So it really depends on how high your vaccination rate is. In places like Alabama, uh, many, many more unvaccinated people are getting infected, which is why their intensive care units are full, because they don't have as many vaccinated people uh, to get infected. And when they do get infected, they're unvaccinated and get really ill. Do we still have Dr. Schooley? Are you there? I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure when you lost me. I'm having some internet instability issues. Um, did you leave me before or after I was vaccinated? Before. Okay. The um, to get to the uh, to to answer the question shortly, um, it's about in, in San Diego right now. It's uh, it's about fifty fifty, but we have many more vaccinated people than unvaccinated people. So if you're unvaccinated, your chance of getting infected is much higher than if you're vaccinated. Great. Thank you. Next question, we can open this up to um, the three doctors, Dr. Schooley, Sosha, and Anderson. My daughter tested positive for COVID and only had the first dose of the vaccine. Do you recommend that she gets the second dose or not? Thank you for your answer. I'll just step in since my microphone is open. I would, uh, it would depend to some extent on what the timing of it is. Uh, and I don't know all the details of your daughter, uh, but um, we know that, uh, becoming infected boosts your immunity as well. So in essence, your daughter has had a infection and a booster by being vaccinated and then having uh, an infection to go with it. We also know that people who've been infected get further benefit from a, another vaccination. So I'd wait a couple of months after her infection and then go ahead and get her her second, uh, her second vaccination and go from there. Yeah, to add to Chip's comment, in that setting, please fill out one of the medical exemption forms for a temporary exception, and then wait the couple months and get the second dose of the vaccine. That way you'll be compliant with the mandate and everybody be happy at school because you're meeting the mandate. You'll also be taking good care of your daughter. Beautiful, great comments. All right, our next question is for Dr. Schooley or Dr. Jampy Bannerman. Why were the recommendations related to pregnancy recently changed? And what are the risks if one is pregnant and unvaccinated? So I can tell you there's a couple of reasons they were changed. Um, 
one of the reasons was that we accumulated more data of safety. Uh, and so we felt more comfortable. I was one of the folks who made some of the national recommendations. So I can tell you that we felt more uh, comfortable changing the recommendations from having a conversation to uh, recommending vaccination. But the other piece was that with the uh, kind of emergence of the Delta variant, all of a sudden we had a much more contagious um, virus. Um, and in that setting, we had many unvaccinated pregnant women who were kind of hesitant to get vaccinated because the recommendations weren't strong enough. So the combination of a stronger virus, um, hesitancy with unclear guidelines and pregnant women getting sick, I can tell you that we're seeing it all of the time. Even just before I got on this conference, uh, a friend texted me that another friend who was a teacher who was pregnant died. It's happening every day. And so we really need to get pregnant women vaccinated. Not only is it important for the woman, but she can actually give antibodies to the newborn such that the newborn is protected for the first several months of life. It is one of the most important things you can do as a pregnant person. Thank you very much. Great answer. We have another question for Dr. Sosha. If a student is informed that they were in close contact with a COVID positive student, why doesn't the sibling have to stay home as well? Well, not everyone who's been exposed will convert. And certainly vaccinated students have a much low, lower likelihood of acquiring that infection after an exposure. So we generally do not recommend multiple circles of exposure after the first time. Um, if for any reason you wanted to keep a child at home just to be on the safer side, I think that's an option you could exercise. I think it's important that the student who is actually exposed does get a COVID test. We recommend that they are tested three to five days after exposure, because that's when they're likely to show that they have converted from an exposure to an actual infection. And that setting, the members of the household, because we all live together in our house, we don't wear our masks all the times in our homes. So the entire household generally has been exposed. And we need to be very careful. The other thing I would say is be very mindful of who's in your house. So many times we have multiple generations in a household, or we have a parent or another sibling who has a medical condition that makes them more vulnerable. So in that setting, you may want the exposed student to actually mask in the household and try and stay away from a vulnerable, let's say, grandparent who's undergoing cancer treatment and some other things. So be mindful of who makes up your household to try and take care of them. But again, not everyone who's exposed will become infected. If you have been vaccinated, your chance of becoming infected is reduced, not zero, but it is one of the benefits of vaccination. So hopefully this will help and um, our contract tracers, tracers and public health team will give families advice about how best to handle in their personal situation um, an exposure. Great, Dr. Sosha, just go ahead and keep your mic on because this next question is for you as well. Sure. Will routine testing be required for all students regardless of vaccination status? And what is the recommended frequency? That is a very good question that we're actually working on quite a bit to decide for the campus community. We think that the unvaccinated student population and employees as well and faculty should test at least twice a week. We are looking at uh, considering a weekly testing though for the vaccinated community, partly as a reflection of the Delta viral, uh, virus's activity in San Diego. Uh, well, that decision will probably be made in the next week or two, and we'll be communicating it to the Preuss community as well. Okay, great. Here's a question for Dr. Schooley or Dr. Sosha. If a person tested positive for COVID already, are they still mandated to have the vaccine? So I'll give that question. The mandate does say that you have 90 days from the diagnosis to defer vaccination. After that, you should be vaccinated. And that's because natural COVID infection does not give you the same benefits of the vaccination. So we strongly recommend that individuals with natural COVID infections, however they acquire it, still should vaccinate. You don't even have to wait the full 90 days. We want you to be feeling better. If you're feeling great at 40, 45 days, please get vaccinated. But you can, under the mandate, have a 90-day window to hold off on the vaccination. 
after which your temporary medical defer exemption will expire and you'll need to vaccinate within eight weeks of that time period. And just to follow up, this was a live question, Dr. Schooley or Dr. Sosha. I have a sister who tested positive for COVID. How long do you recommend to wait for her to get the vaccine? You know, she um, will be pretty safe from getting reinfected with COVID for about 90 days. Um, and then uh, the farther out she goes, the more likely it is if she is exposed to someone, she'll get another bout of COVID. So we recommend uh, getting uh, your vaccine sometime before that 90 day period comes up. Uh, our immune systems do best if they've had a little bit of time to mature and to think about what they've seen. And so we generally uh, think that if you wait six or eight weeks after you've had your uh, infection, you'll get a better boost uh, with your vaccination. So I generally recommend getting it between two and three months after your, uh, after your illness. Great, thank you. Another question for the two of you, Dr. Sosha and Dr. Schooley. What precautions do we still need to take even though we are vaccinated? Well, we know that uh, vaccinated people um, also can shed virus and also can acquire virus. That's what the breakthrough infections are about. And we have a lot of COVID uh, circulating in our community these days. And so um, what I've been doing is when I go out and I'm gonna be in a place where other people are, particularly indoors, I put a mask on. And I do that to keep myself from becoming exposed. Uh, I would probably do okay because I've been vaccinated. Uh, and I'm otherwise healthy, but I might uh, get infected and shed it and give it to somebody who has a renal transplant or hasn't been vaccinated lately. And if I do get it, I'll give the virus a chance to uh, make new variants that might be more uh, dangerous to the rest of the population uh, than if uh, it, it doesn't have me to grow in. So I think while the um, level of infection is high in the community, it's best for all of us to uh, mask up when we go indoors uh, with other people. And if we're outdoors at a a uh, busy event with a bunch of people shouting and yelling for uh, the Preuss School um, volleyball team. Uh, it's probably good to throw a mask on, not have people yelling in your face. Uh, but uh, as things get better, uh, we'll be able to get back to where we want to be. And as booster shots get out there, we'll have less leakiness. But right now is a good time to wear a mask when you're, whether you're vaccinated or not around other people indoors in particular. All right, great, great answer here. We have another question. For Dr. Sosha, is the vaccination mandatory at this point? Yes, for the community, campus community, you need to be vaccinated uh, and full vaccination uh, is what you need to achieve. And during an interval between starting your vaccination and full vaccination, follow the recommendations for unvaccinated individuals. So either you're vaccinated or you have an approved exception or deferral. That is a requirement to be on campus that goes into effect September 6th. That's why we want you to make sure if you are gonna request an exception, let the front pick up a form and get that form into the Preuss front desk by September 2nd. If you are someone who's partially vaccinated, in other words, I've got started, but I won't be fully vaccinated by September 6th, please let us know that as well complete your vaccination, follow the recommendation for unvaccinated until you cross that special two week line, and then you move into what we call the vaccinated community. But you will not be able to do nothing. I think that's the important part to keep here, that this requirement from UCOP doesn't allow you to do nothing. You either have to show you've been vaccinated or receive one of the approved exceptions or deferrals. Um, that if you do that, you will be compliant with the mandate and then you follow the recommendations for vaccinated individuals or unvaccinated individuals. And if we do all those things together, we're gonna keep a very safe community. Well, I am afraid that this is all the time we have for tonight, but trust parents, we will remain here available for you throughout the year. We'll be having more town halls, having more opportunities to have conversation and to keep you informed to keep you close and supported. I wanna thank all of the panel for joining us tonight. I want to ask you if you'd like to have a few closing comments um, because we will be able to take a few closing comments with our panelists before we shut down for this evening. I would like to add a closing comment just to highlight um, some of the actions that Dr. Sosha and Dr. Schooley uh, pointed out around vaccination. So, you know, even though 
we really want uh, people to be vaccinated for all of the reasons discussed, the behaviors that are important for preventing transmission, we get used to them over time, right? Changing behaviors, acquiring new behaviors, engaging in, in good public health behaviors takes a little bit of practice. And so if you found yourself to have been infected or you have a family member or a friend who's been infected, um, also be sure that in this period where you're waiting to get your vaccination, you begin to practice some of the routine things that help to keep us all um, protected and minimize the chances of us passing things uh, back and forth to each other, making sure you always have a mask on you, wearing your mask indoors, in crowded uh, settings, in gatherings, uh, particularly with individuals for whom you do not know um, their vaccination status. So I just you know, thought we put that out there a bit more explicitly than we had over the last hour. Great, and I'd like to just let you know that that's Dr. Cheryl Anderson, professor and interim chair of the Department of the Family Medicine and Public Health at the School of Medicine at UC San Diego. Yeah, and I, I would just like to add briefly that in a community of parents who are listening, it's very likely that you know someone who's either pregnant or you yourself might be pregnant or with a newborn. And one of the most important things that you can do is encourage vaccination um, to your pregnant friends. Not only is it safe and effective, but it protects the mom and it protects the newborn baby. So please consider vaccination. Thank you. Are there any other comments from our illustrious panel members? I just wish you a great year in school and uh, we'll be here to help get through it all. And uh, please direct any questions or comments and advice you have to us. We're, uh, we wanna be your partners and having you and your students have a great year back at Price. Awesome. Again, we will be attempting to answer every question in an FAQ that we'll post on the PROIS website and the UC San Diego Return to Learn website. A recording of this town hall will be there as well as on YouTube. So you can share the link and we'll share with our parents as well for those who are unable to attend tonight. I wanna to again, thank our panelists, our presenters and our guests for sharing their time, their information and their talent with us today. I wanna to thank you parents, families, our scholars and employees of the Proy School for attending tonight and working together to help bring us through these unprecedented times. Tonight, we had more than 300 attendees, but these town halls are a very important way to stay united and connected as a community. To help improve them, we encourage you to complete the post-event survey that will be sent to you shortly to help us continue to refine our communications during what we consider a very stressful period. This concludes the Preuss Vaccine Mandate Town Hall. Again, thank you very much for coming. Much love and respect. Have a good evening.